You do need to hear. Okay, we're live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook viewers. We'll just wait a few more minutes till we invite everybody in from our Zoom call. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're just going to add, ask, uh, wait a few more minutes for more people to come in. Hi, Lisa. Hey, David. Good to see you. Stephanie, Ronnie, Barb, Amy, Suzanne, Stella, Dara, Diana, Stephanie, Ramy, Kay, Megan. This is where it starts getting confused. Kara, Allison. I'm so excited to have everybody here today. Hi, Jill. Hi, Heather. Diana. All right, I think we have our crew. Welcome everybody to Casual Conversations, our Zoom show based on originally the Brain Injury Professional Magazine, Women Against Brain Injury, and now it's expanded. Uh, I think we're in our seventh month of the show. So thank you. There's so many things that you can watch um, or do. And now that we are out of our, most of us out of our virtual cocoons, um, it's just really exciting to keep having people show up here. Um, First, before we I introduce my exciting guest today, I'm going to invite Margaret from IBIA to share a little something with you. Kara Ferber, you, my friend, were the first person to register for the Brain Injury Race for Research. So congratulations. You, my friend, will get a $25 refund on your registration for the Virtual World Congress on Brain Injury. You're, you're muted. <laughs> so to be a nerd, well, I finish first as well. It yes. doesn't matter. That's not the <laughs> point. The point is to support um, research in the brain injury space, the brain injury space and support young investigators. So well, I'm, I'm very about to push very in happy the chat that um, a, a few little details and a registration link. We hope everybody who's on this um, we'll take the moment to register and support the program. Um, it's, you, you do it at your own pace. You've got a week to um, get out there and walk three miles. You don't have to do it all at one time. You can run, you could walk, you could swim, you could dance, whatever you want to do. The point is, is to support um, IBIA's efforts to fund research and young investigators in upcoming programs and um, other things that we do. So that being said, I'll post everything. If you don't see it in the chat, oh, Catherine, put it back up there. Um, <clears throat> that would be great. And Catherine, now back to you. Hello. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. I am so excited to invite you to spend the next hour with me with a friend of mine. We're just trying to figure out how long we've known each other. If we think five or six years, um, we talked right after the second pink event at Palo Alto at the Palo Alto VA at Stanford University. And then we didn't get to meet till actually the Minnesota Super Bowl, which was the coldest event I've ever attended. So welcome, Beth. Welcome to Casual Conversations. Hi, Catherine. Glad to be here. And speaking of cold, I'm based in Chicago. So it seemed nice and balmy when I was up there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was the only city I've ever gone to, and I was there for three days, and I didn't see one living creature, not a pigeon, not a squirrel, like there was nothing. There was nothing there but cold and ice. Hunkered down, staying warm. So it's good to have you on the show, and there's so many exciting things to talk about with you. What I thought we'd do is start on your childhood. Tell us a little bit <laughs> about where you grew up. Hi. Well, I, you know, I grew up not thinking I was going to be a neurologist and, um, you know, but I did always like science and was always doing experiments and so forth. Spent a little bit of time here in the Midwest um, and uh, really enjoyed reading. So that's what I liked doing as a young child. In high school, did you take all the biology classes? Were you instantly a science geek? <laughs> I was in all of the honor courses, that is true, and I love taking chemistry and physics and 
everything I could possibly study. I thought it was really, really fun. So, and what yeah. options did you see yourself uh, going off to college that you would have in the science world? I'd always loved nutrition. So, I, you know, I was always studying nutrition, looking up vitamins, minerals, the best ways, the healthiest ways to eat. Uh, loved it, loved it, loved it. So I pursued a degree in nutrition and food science and absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. So in the food science realm, you can do really neat things. Like you can make meat analogs out of soy, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And then I went on to become a registered dietitian and got my master's in clinical nutrition. Loved that as well. And was very happy being a registered dietitian. Until one day, uh, I came across some of my friends in medicine, and we were talking about some of the patient cases. And I started reading Harrison's uh, internal medicine book and Cecil's internal medicine book for fun. And I remember my physician friend said, you know, you could do this too if you wanted to. <laughs> but you're right. I could do this if I wanted to. So then I went back to medical school and ended up going into neurology. How old were you when you went to medical school? Uh, I was, uh, I would say, oh, I don't get into all ages because age, anyone can study yeah. science at any age, but it wasn't right after undergrad. What it was is I went and got my master's. I worked for a bit. Then I had to go back and take courses at Northwestern actually to make sure I met all of my pre-med requirements. And um, then from there applied, took my MCAT, applied to med school, got in and loved it. Absolutely loved it. So you don't have to go like everybody else, you can define your own path, regardless of your age, whether maybe you got through high school earlier, or maybe you got through high school later, or went to college earlier or later, you know, there's no particular age that you can choose to follow your passion. I think that's so inspiring, because too often, I feel like if you don't, uh, if you don't decide what you're going to be by the time you're 21, it's hard to change courses in the medicine field. What are, <laughs> what are yeah, the what opportunities or barriers um, did you face um, as a woman coming from a nutrition field into med school? Well, I would say for me, I just hadn't considered going into medicine. It never occurred to me. I wasn't opposed to the idea, just I never thought of it. And I absolutely love nutrition. I uh, of training on that and reading and so forth, still immersed. But in terms of going back to medical school, it was really just deciding I wanted to. I think the biggest rate limiting step for me was I didn't think about it. It didn't cross my mind. And I didn't realize that I would be really good at neuroscience until I was exposed to it. And it was like a duck to water. Absolutely loved it. I knew I wanted to do it. You know, in thinking about this for everyone that's listening out there, you don't, I didn't know I would love neurology until I was exposed to it. Same thing for everybody on this call. I would really encourage everyone to take opportunities to either speak with your parents or your parents' friends, do, do visits in their, wherever they work, ask them about their career, and you may be surprised at what you absolutely love. And then, so you graduated medical school, and then where did you go? So then from medical school, you choose a residency. So one of the big decision points in medical school was, I thought I was going to go into become a nephrologist because I had worked as a renal dietitian and I loved that as well. But then I met neurology. And once I met neurology, there was no turning back, loved it. So what I did from there is you have to go and do your training. So I did training in internal medicine and I was over at University of Chicago. And then I went back to Rush for some training. And then I was out on the West Coast um, in Southern California working in a hospital called Harbor UCLA, which is a fantastic hospital. And fun fact, was featured on the TV show, if you guys want to YouTube it, uh, called ER, I think. I can't remember, but it was featured on one of those medical TV shows back in the 70s. Oh, or may maybe it was called Emergency. No, it was called Emergency. That's what it was called. <laughs> and how did you find that your background in nutrition helped with neurology? Because that's a, I haven't heard of that combination before, so I think you're pretty unique. You're right. And in fact, when I was interviewing for different positions in neurology, I would frequently be told, how did you pick neurology? <laughs> we would have thought you would have picked endocrinology. Um, I would say, however, that nutrition is part and parcel of neurology. 
It's extremely important for your brain. What you, you are, what you eat. And we know from really well done studies that depending on what you eat, even the lipid layers and the membranes in your brain are different. Another, another important area, for example, is when you look at Parkinson's, there's obviously a gut brain axis. So we're seeing that some of this may actually start in your GI tract. Uh, it's very, very important. So the gut brain connection is extremely strong. And I think we're just beginning to learn about this. It's so, a very exciting area. Yeah. So what, so tell me how long have you been at Abbott? Gosh, you know, I remember when I started at Abbott, when I was saying, I've been here one month, I've been here seven months. And then fast forward, I've been at Abbott 11 years. Wow. That's amazing. And I was just mm -hmm. looking at Abbott as a company. They're um, um, 130 years old. Abbott's in 160 countries and over 100,000 employees. It's a rather large place. It is. And I have to say, it's a joy to work there. We work with some of the best and the brightest in the world. When we get on our conference calls in this global community, we have folks representing all parts of the world with lots of different perspectives and bringing so much to the table. So that's an absolute joy. So tell me a little bit about how you take your background and the role that you play at Abbott. Well, you know, I've been very fortunate that Abbott has such a broad reach and has so many wonderful programs and so much research going on. We've been working, I've been working a lot in the neuroscience space, specifically looking at blood tests that relate to brain injury. And we've been working very, very closely and in great detail with over 140 of our scientists over the past depending on when you want to call it, between 10 to, to eight years, um, partnered with the Department of Defense, looking at ways to figure out if the brain has been injured. I was also fortunate to work at Abbott on a wonderful program called the Center for Nutrition, Learning and Memory that came through Abbott Nutrition and was a partnership with the University of Illinois and other academic centers. Looking at how does food impact the brain? which was a very important collaboration. Well, there's two directions and questions to go there, but let me see. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna stick <laughs> with brain injury, the invisible injury, we're invisible patients. I think you really, you and I really resonated with the same message that I was trying to get out that women had, there were sex and gender differences in brain injury. You got that point and, um, Abbott has, has contributed to pink concussions um, a number of times to help us get our message out in events. Um, I think the important part of an invisible injury or invisible illness is having diagnostic um, criteria to make it real. In the same way, I mean, you can't mm -hmm. see diabetes, but you stick your finger and you get a number. It tells you what to do. We don't have that in brain injury. So given that, tell us what Abbott's looking for in brain injury to try to help with that invisible injury. Catherine, you have this so correct. It is an invisible injury. And what we're looking to do is take the invisible and make it visible right? We're trying to avoid the icebergs and, and, and keep our ship sailing nice and smooth. So what we have done is we partnered actually in officially in, in August of 2014, we made our announcement with the United States Department of Defense that we were going to work on making two blood tests for the brain and optimizing them on our portable handheld device. You can use two or three drops of plasma Basically, you, you draw someone's blood, you put two or three drops of plasma on this cartridge, and then you wait 15 minutes. And if these brain proteins are present at a certain level, it, it serves as a warning bell that further evaluation is needed. And importantly, if those proteins are negative, then you can feel confident that you don't need to go in and get a head CT, for example. So exactly to your point, what we're looking at is taking something that was very subjective and invisible and putting a spotlight on it to help clinicians and patients make an informed decision. And I liked how you talked about the fact that it's invisible and you can't see it. You know, when you, someone sprains their ankle, you can see that their ankle swells up and they know not to walk on it because they can injure it. With brain injury, the brain gets injured and 
people don't realize or they keep going on. And I would argue as a neurologist that your brain is vastly more important than your ankle. You wouldn't go on a 20 mile hike with an injured ankle or a pulled hamstring. So make sure you take care of that brain. In the military in, uh, arena, um, in sort of a, in a combat situation, is this something that you imagine medics will carry on them or something that would be more at um, a mobile hospital unit to decide whether somebody needs to be airlifted to a high, you know, triage to a higher level of care? You know, Catherine, sitting here in my, in my home um, with my flowers behind me, I, I don't pretend to be in the military, but I don't speak on behalf of the military. But um, what we do know is that these brain proteins can work in a wide variety of situations. And uh, we're hopeful that this test will be available to whomever needs it. Okay, because I, 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 from talking to veterans, um, especially ones that knew they were injured in the moment, but felt such loyalty to their unit, to their patrol, to the mission that they were on, they didn't want to raise their hand and say that I'm injured. So I see a role for a test in that situation. Also for the person that's injured, doesn't know they're injured, unaware of the injury because they have a brain injury. I see, mm -hmm. see that uh, that that type of test using both those situations where someone doesn't want to uh, admit what they know or someone that can't admit what they don't know. So I'm, I'm really excited to see how that ends up being used. The other thing I think is important to know here is one of the main symptoms or one of the main things that happens with brain injury is confusion or perhaps sometimes amnesia. So if, if you can't remember what happened and if you're confused, it's hard to articulate that you've forgotten and you're confused, right? Because your brain isn't working properly. So having an objective test will really be helpful to, to frame that discussion. And where is that, where is the test right now on the continuum from it works to it actually can be purchased by certain institutions? Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm glad you asked. So we, we've worked on it, as I said, since 2014, we have over 130 scientists that worked on it in multiple locations. We were building on all the great work that the Department of Defense worked on and, um, and so we got, we were cleared earlier this year and, and we're working as quickly as we can to make it available as, as we know there's a huge interest in this. That's awesome. And then let's talk a little bit about uh, nutrition in the brain. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna go to a Q and A in a few minutes and I know you can't answer personal questions about anyone's particular care, but what in your own, what in your own day-to-day -day routine um, do you do if you want to share that or just talk about, you know, any nutrition in the brain where you would want to go with that? Sure, sure. I love this topic as a dietitian and as a uh -oh. this is just general information. Um, but in terms of what I do, I, I try to follow a very healthy diet. I, I believe in eating a lot of colorful foods and fruits and vegetables. I also enjoy kombucha and green tea. And, you know, I get teased a lot because I always follow such a nice, healthy diet. But I tell you, the other thing is, is when we look at your brain is the power of exercise and the power of green exercise in particular. And what I mean by that is getting outside, being in nature, uh, going for a hike, going for a walk, really, really stress hormones and just hold your whole body. So again, everyone should talk to their physician and see what's right for them, but huge believer in the impact of diet and exercise on your brain. Um. Or having, I had a little uh, uh, trouble hearing part of that. Um, Kara, are you having also? You're hearing that too? Yeah, we're hard to hear. A little trouble, a little trouble with your Wi-Fi. Um, hmm. Okay, I'm not sure. Let's see. I just want to give you a second. Okay. I'm having some questions come in about the test. I just wanted to, uh, while we're doing, um, does it need to be a blood draw or does it a finger prick to get two or three drops of blood? 
right now. Can you hear me better now, Catherine? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, right now, it would be a blood draw. And then that said, you know, our app's vision for our TBI blood tests would be in the future that this would be available throughout the continuum of care where wherever it's needed the most, exactly to your point, uh, whether it's going to be in the hospital or in the community. So we're looking at a wide variety of options. But, it, you know, a, a step of a journey of many miles starts with the first few steps. And we're really excited to have a blood test for the brain. Oh, and another little fun fact um, for this blood test, we're measuring down the picogram level. And one picogram is the weight of DNA in one hummingbird cell. So we're measuring down to very, very low levels. We're really excited about that and much more to come. A couple more questions on um, what, act, what protein is it actually measuring? We're measuring not just one, but two proteins. We're measuring GFAP, glial fibrillocytic protein, and UCHL1, ubiquitin carboxyhydrolase one And what's important about that is that they come from two different cell types in the brain. One of them is neuronal and one of them is glial. So it gives you a nice swath of information to really effectively evaluate what's happening. Um, and then what, technically, what was the test cleared for? So it was cleared in the United States uh, for rule out need for a head CT within 12 hours after injury. So that is our first, that is our first uh, clearance. That is awesome. Um, what we'll do is people are asking how to spell those proteins. So when Hope writes up her notes about this call, we'll make sure we have those, those exact proteins. So, um, Wow. Yeah, they're long <laughs> phrases, Catherine. You get a lot of points in Scrabble for those. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have trouble pronouncing people's names. I'll stay away from <laughs> molecules. Uh, <laughs> the other piece I wanted to ask you was, what do you see in the future that you would like to work on? What, you know, what direction would you personally like to go in the career that you've had so far, given that you have just such a unique background? Oh, we'll see. We are very committed, very committed to finishing this. There's a lot to do. I will get writing in a lot of publications that we're very excited about and sharing you know, more information. I know there's a lot of interest in this. And then I think something that's really important is to just stay open, right? Always keep learning. You know, every day I read hours and hours every day. Some, some about traumatic brain injury, some about the brain, but a wide variety of scientific uh, articles and so forth. I think it's extremely important. Keep reading. Keep reading. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you see in the brain injury field itself beyond what sort of, you know, if, if you have this test, what's sort of the next piece of what you'd like to do in the brain injury field? Well, we are looking at a variety of other areas. Uh, right now we're looking at the first claim is for adults. We are now looking into pediatrics. We're evaluating how these brain proteins work in children. We're also looking at other potential indications. We're working very hard with different folks globally in, in a variety of research trials and thousands of patients to see how we could best support the evaluation and treatment of patients. So a lot of work is going on by some very, very smart people. It's a very exciting. Especially important in pediatrics, I think, um, mm -hmm. especially so in that birth to two year point where they cannot articulate um, what's happened, if the caregiver has hurt them in any way. And, and I know that, you know, tragically, sometimes brain injury is missed when um, there is a, uh, and I always get it, it's shaken baby is now called pediatric who knows what shaken baby is now called because it's not called shaken baby anymore but that in, in those situations where there has been an injury and immediate uh response to that has best for the long-term care of the child but the child can't articulate at that young age so the pediatric piece is really mm -hmm. important the other thing I'm, we're really excited about Catherine is looking at concussion in women so you know that's a very important area very important. When we look at women, let's for, say, for example, female athletes, 
And we know that women at a higher rate of concussion than their male counterparts in several sports, for example, soccer or lacrosse, you know, field hockey, women are at a very high risk of concussion and women may have longer symptoms and a protracted recovery. So it's extremely important to bring awareness to this. I think sometimes when I'm speaking with different groups or meeting different folks, women, for whatever reason, think, well, what? you know, I, I don't, I couldn't have had a concussion or I don't have time to have a concussion <laughs> and they just keep going. It's extremely important to get evaluated because you can't treat what you don't know. And your brain is particularly vulnerable, especially in those first 10 days to 14 days after injury. And there's a lot that you need to do to rest and recovery and optimize your return to health. So well, really that, important. That segues perfectly into my last section, which is the friendship that you and I have had over these five years and talking about these issues. And um, I have come to you multiple times to try to get researchers to use the diagnostic tests that you have um, in their concussion research. Do you just want to share a little bit of some of the diagnostic tests that you think are important? Because not only does Abbott sure. make products, but Abbott also mm -hmm. makes diagnostic testing, which is the piece that you and I have spent most time talking about. Right. So when we look at women, you know, we're not we're not uh, men obviously. So when we look at our brain architecture, you can see that perhaps some of our, we have more axons, but they may be smaller as, and uh, may have, we have different courses of recovery. So other things you could look at would be the effect of female hormones on the brain. That's another feature that we may have that can impact whether we're injured, whether we're protected, whether we recover. We know there's, there are fluctuations of progesterone, LH, FSH, estrogen, and depending on where the level of those hormones are, you may have a different outcome. So if you had sustained the exact same injury at a different time, when perhaps you had a higher or lower level of a certain hormone, that may indeed impact how you do. So that's a very important area of research and, and one that we're looking at now. So that's going to take some time and, and a large, large numbers of cohorts to look at, but we're, we're definitely digging in and seeing what we can find there. Other things to think about too, not just for women, but for men, um, thyroid, for example, and other neuroendocrine abnormalities that may happen. And then in men looking at this testosterone. So what we see in some of the men that have had concussions over the years is uh, sometimes their testosterone level is low. So everyone's unique. It, you know, it may or may not happen, but if you don't know until you look. And we are definitely doing the research to try and sort all of that out. It's very important. It's, it's, it is really important, Beth. And I do know that the military protocol is that one year after a moderate to severe TBI, that an entire hormone panel is done. And the, the emphasis was the male panel, because in that situation they were talking about men at the time in the military you know and i would like to see over you know i'd like to see in the next couple of years that you know a protocol for women hormone you know to figure out where and when after tbi women should be checked um i think it's incredibly important i'm always talking to women um, after concussions to work with their gynecologist and to follow up on um, any changes to their period, more severe period going away, issues with their sleep. Um, and, and the importance that I believe is that, and we've talked about this with other specialists on this show, is that we do have treatment for hormone issues. So if the TBI leads to a hormone issue and you find out about that hormone issue, there's treatment. Yeah. I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Another area for people to think about is depression. You know, you may be at a depression after a concussion and folks don't realize that and that's treatable too. So if you've sustained a concussion, really paying attention to how you're sleeping and any changes in your personality, your mood, make sure you go in and get evaluated and, and not suffer in silence. Well, I know I've been watching questions going in and I'm sure Kara is busy reading them. I have been asking a few of them as we've been talking. Um, in the last minutes, I just wanted to acknowledge um, you and Abbott for a grant 
um, that you gave to pink concussions uh, last year and that grant is allowing us to provide 16 hours of CME credit um, and three full days of presentations at Pink X, which will be at the IBIA World Congress, July 28th through 30th. It's like a great conference and it's our honor to be able to support. Well, it's really great. Our, our friendship has been important to me because I've been able to call you and ask questions. I've asked you to get on phones with uh, phone calls with researchers who I wasn't able to convince uh, that hormone testing should be specific to females. And you have the know-how and the knowledge to get on those calls. And just the fact that financially you have supported us. Um, this grant is a $25,000 grant. It's the largest grant we've ever had. So I, I wanted to thank you for that. That's not why I asked you on the show today, but uh, I did want to thank you because it's allowing us to provide some topics, um, domestic violence and TBI, women in the prison system and TBI, and then systemic barriers to women of color in the brain injury field and systemic barriers to professionals of color in the in the brain injury field. So those topics are, are, are very new to the brain injury field. And I want to thank you for supporting us in a way that we can present that and, and get the top experts and, and move the field along. Yes, thank you, Catherine. I remember when you first reached out to us and we became aware of your, your organization, such important work. Another little anecdote is I remember when I was traveling on the East Coast for a meeting and I just happened to turn on my hotel TV to catch the weather and there you were on the Today Show talking about concussions and advocating for the appropriate evaluation of concussions and treatment. So it seems we, we, we even run into each other even accidentally in different locations. It's been, it's been lovely. Well, and thank you. I was on for about a minute, not even. So I'm glad that you turned on the TV. <laughs> I was a, a, I was a, I think a B reel, but I, I did get a couple of questions. And actually, they took the question after they told me they had stopped taping, and then they took that part of my interview. Um, well, so, I appreciated yeah, so, seeing you, and you did a great job on that. Well, thank you. Um, so. I know that we have questions going and uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, uh, shaken baby is now called abusive head trauma. I don't know when I will remember that, but there's always someone on the call that can remind me of that. Um, again, we've been talking to Beth about her career as a, a certified nutritionist and then as a neurologist and then her role at Abbott and the, some of the things that Abbott's working on and uh, food and brain injury and uh, the concussion tests that they are working on. Um, and then finally on hormones and the importance of female specific protocols in brain injury. So I'm gonna change my view to be able to see everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, Cara, I know there were a lot of questions flying by there. Um, I think what we'll try to do is we'll do one question from the floor and then one question from the chat and see what we can get through. And I do wanna just ask, um, that let's not put um, Beth in a position of answering any specific health questions to your personal brain injury or uh, you know any anything that's going to get her in trouble. I promised I wouldn't get her in trouble today with anybody. Um, and uh, again, uh, Beth, if a question is not in your lane, it's perfectly appropriately on this show to say not on my lane, and we'll get a specialist on to answer that question. So. Um, okay. who would, who would like to ask a question? Lisa, please on mic and ask my friend Beth a question. Uh, Lisa, you need to, un you need to unmute. And then I see Dennis has asked a great question. Oh. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Hi, Beth. And hi, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask the question. Um, I am a national certified brain injury specialist, and I have had my own um, from a severe car accident. 
And in the course of my studies, I run across the gut brain um, um, mm -hmm. as well. And so I'm wondering what you think about the ketosis and, um, and not the ketosis diet, but looking at the foods that are in the keto plan, such as the white meats, chicken, fish, turkey, the green vegetables, the fruits and the nuts. How do you, is there a certain, certain foods that you recommend? In terms after brain injury? Right. Oh, Lisa, okay. So I do like, I like the question about ketones. I'm gonna answer this in a couple different parts here. Um, as, a, as a dietitian, when before I became a neurologist, we were frequently called on to do ketogenic diets, particularly for children that were having seizures. And we do see efficacy in ketogenic diets in a variety of different types of injury. So that's been well established for quite some time. And when you look at some really well done research, we do know that in certain types of brain injury, ketones are the preferred substrate for the brain and also having good glucose control is important to promote outcomes. Very important. Um, that said, you know, there, are, is all, there would also be a lot of research that I've seen and it, exactly to your point, fruits and vegetables are extremely important. Um, you need the different flavonoids and polyphenols and, and all kinds of extracts and things. They really keep your brain in an anti-inflammatory state, fish oils, uh, things along that those lines, uh, the fermented foods, blueberries, raspberries, uh, all, all of those sorts of things are very good indeed for your brain. Green tea, very important. So what I would say for this is that I'm a huge advocate and supporter of registered dietitians. And I know registered dietitians have different specialties, just like physicians do. You can work with one near you on what's specific for you. And you can go to the American Dietetic Association's website I believe it's uh, www.eatright.org. And they have a place where you can search for a dietitian for you, for your special needs and, and what you're looking to accomplish in your, in your neighborhood. So great question. It needs to be individualized and you hit all of the important highlights there, all combined in one great question. Thank, Thank you, you for your answer. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Dennis, do you have a question for Dr. McQuiston? And then um, uh, Cara, Cara will answer, ask the next question. Yeah, thank you for presenting, Dr. McQuiston, um, and congratulations on the test. Do you see this as being the first in, in many tests to come? Are things speeding up when it comes to research for blood-based tests? And what targets or biomarkers are you excited about? Hi, yeah, thank you very much for your question. We are looking at a wide variety of different markers in, in blood tests, acute setting and longitudinal. It's been injured and then following them up over many, many months. So we will see. We are really doing a deep dive on that as are many other folks. And I think every day there are more and more uh, results coming from some really well-designed trials. So for that, I would say stay tuned and we're, we're Definitely looking. Kara? Um, I, I had a question and then I saw one that um, was similar to what, to what I was saying. And um, I, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. I really appreciate and um, respect and um, the work that you're doing. Very interesting. And as both a survivor and an advocate, it's wonderful to have this uh, information available. Um, my question, um, and Hillary asked as well, if, if you foresee any chance for like self-administration of this test or um, because I know whether it's dealing with, whether it's like athletic trainers and in mm -hmm. school and testing children or for, for example, women who experience intimate partner violence, who may not even have a chance, you know, to go to the hospital. Like if um, I think there's a lot of like women in specific who haven't been diagnosed and or have access to care to be able to do that. Um, so if you foresee um, that at all being happening, either like self administrators you know, athletic trainers or educators or area. Well, we started this, this journey with this uh, first to really excited about and we 
a number of divisions, some of the top researchers and scientists were providing the same level of academic rigor that we did with this first product in a variety of different areas. So stay tuned, active research under, underway. And I understand what you're saying. This, you know, certain places are very sensitive and access problems and perhaps you know, insurance concerns, all of that is extremely important and underscores the importance of having this test available to a wide variety of people in a wide variety of settings. So I really appreciate that comment and feedback. Thank you. Um, a question I see also is that, that you said within the first 12 hours of injury. So does that mean the test is only accurate within the first 12 hours? Um, is it, and I know also for women, sometimes it's more like prolonged um, mm -hmm. time before symptoms appear. I don't know if that necessarily means it would be, you know, the same with the test, but um, so I guess the timeline. Yep. That's, that's love that question. question. Love that question. So what we, what we, that was FDA clearance, which is really important. That's a really high bar. And, and for the first indication that we're pursuing, it was within 12 hours. There are a number of articles using our prototype biomarkers for GPAP and UCHN1 that do demonstrate that these biomarkers are present for an even longer period of time. So again, stay tuned on that. The, the, the journey starts with one step and um, we're looking to make this available wherever it may work. Right, but to succinctly ask, answer your question, it does, the markers do remain in the bloodstream longer than that, and we are actively exploring what that means in terms of an indication. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. very good. Great question, great question. Um, next, I see, does the blood test give any insight on functional injuries? In terms of prognostic? Mr. Riley, would you like to expand on your? Question. Let's see if she, she can chime in. Um, Maybe the question is about uh, the, uh, you know, have is there any outcome um, that? Hello. 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 Oh, hi. You're here. Sorry, I was having a little hi. bit of um, technical issues here. Seems like it, that's happening today. But again, thank you. Um, again, thank you for having this session. It's been very informative. I've been a huge um, fan of the Pink Concussions platform. Um, but with my question regarding functional injuries, I mean, is there any way to detect if there is a concussion or if there's some functional um, decline after a head injury? Okay. Love this question too. So many good questions. Um, in terms of these biomarkers, we are looking at them in combination with other technologies as well and, and putting them together to help predict a variety of different things. With the biomarkers by themselves, we have seen that in certain research settings and some of our studies um, that they do predict. They do predict how people are going to do over time, depending on how high or how, how low they are. The other thing that we're looking at is multimodality testing. So for example, when you go in and if somebody unfortunately has a, a heart attack or chest pain, traditionally what you would do is you would draw their blood, you might do an ultrasound, you're gonna do your clinical exam, there are a variety of different levers that you pull. And you put, put all of those together to accurately paint that picture. So what we would see is that you could use these just like you do in every other disease state, right? The heart, the liver, the kidneys, the pancreas, they've all had blood tests. The brain didn't, but we do now. So now being able to use this objective way of measuring, you can pull that together with other parameters to really hone in on and get a very clear picture for each individual patient. And then along with that in our trials, we're looking at a lot of neuropsych testing and cognitive performance as well. So we're deep in the middle of all of that. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you, um, Catherine, as well. You guys, thanks. thank you. Great thank question. You. Thank you for the question. I just wanted to ch check, um, Beth, if there's any. If you're definitely on your house Wi-Fi, we are. The, yes. the, uh, the image is a little slow, but the um, verbally we can hear you. And I know there are a lot of questions. Um, May just had a question, and I don't see May. May, do you still have your question? We may have lost uh, May. Yes, I do. Hi, hi, May. Do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, my question is that I would like to know, so the test, it's talking about concussion, but for military personnel, there's the issue with PTSD. 
Is it specific for the concussion? Because there are certain questions where the PTSD can also have some of these symptoms. And is that test specific for concussion or uh, like how specific is it for concussion? So this test, what we're looking at are brain proteins that leak out and are present at a higher level that shouldn't be in the bloodstream, right? So if you imagine um, if you have a pinata and you hit the pinata and the candy falls out, right? You're measuring the candy that falls out. You're measuring the brain proteins that leak out of the brain. That's what we're measuring. And to, in terms of your PTSD question or point, we see PTSD happening in all kinds of brain injury. That's actually been very well studied and, and, and um, we see that a high percentage of people that have had traumatic brain injury do go on to have and sustain PTSD. That's another area of active exploration and research, very important. Thank you. Dennis, did you have another question for Dr. McQuiston? Okay, your hand was still up. Um, uh, we'll go back to Kara. And if anybody else has a question, um, we do have time for more questions. Um, you could put your little hand up under reactions, raise hand is the little hand thing. Catherine, can you, can you still hear me? Yep, absolutely. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I knocked everything over. <laughs> I can speak louder. Okay. Um, I guess in, in um, I see some questions just in regard to, to the nutritionist. Uh, uh, information um, like about what about supplements to help um, with the concussion recovery and how um, exactly does DHA work in the brain to help? And then in regard to the keto, is that dangerous for some people, especially with um, with um, kidney issues? Sure. So that's why I would say you 100% for any of this need to get in and uh, see a your di doctor and your dietitian. Everyone has unique has a unique fingerprint, if you will, or medical background and what's right for one person wouldn't necessarily be right for another. So I think it's extremely important to go in and have it individualized and titrated to yourself. For example, so either there are some people take omega-3s, great. Other people shouldn't be taking omega-3s because maybe they have a coagulation disorder, they have hemophilia, or maybe they're on blood thinners. And you have to be very cautious about that and talk to your doctor in detail and dietitian as a team. So there are a wide variety of options that you can pick from, just like there are a wide variety of cars out there, right? You have to go and pick the one that is the best for you and fits your, your lifestyle the most. So there's no one size fits all in terms of nutrition and the brain. Uh, what, but what we can say is that you can get an, individ, individ, excuse me, an individualized plan to optimize what's right for you. I think that's an important question too, because you hear a lot of times people talking about what works for them and that may be great. But to your point, if someone has renal failure and they're on dialysis, they should not be having a lot of high potassium foods that can be very dangerous for them because their kidneys don't clear that out. So going in and working with your doctor and your dietitian is extremely important. And I, I think another thing that I have to add is in my 10 years of running support groups online for people with brain injury, unfortunately, there is a push for supplements by people with brain injury that are manufacturer reps for certain supplement companies. And they do come on to support groups and post that they've taken this pill, it's changed their whole world. And oh, by the way, they sell it too. So I do think it's important to not take nutritional advice from a support group, from a peer who it, whatever they be doing, they, it may work for them. They may or not be a rep for that product, but that it isn't a dietitian, registered dietitian helping you with your specific makeup. And I, I think that's, I'm a huge supporter of peer support groups, um, but it is the one thing that I have found in that, in that peer support area that we, it, it's a topic I generally either take down the post or put up the cranky moderator post. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it's so important. I like that cranky moderator post. That's funny. Yeah. But you know, what's great is people bring it up, then go ahead and talk with your dietitian or your physician about it. So it's, it's fantastic to discuss it and then check what's right for you. 
Um, so we have Dr. Marshall meet Dr. McQuiston. And what's your question, Dr. Marshall? I just need you to un unmute. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, we're just seeing so much now about inmates that are actually being looked at. And I was wondering this morning, actually, if anyone had done nutritional assays um, to see where they are, certainly you're gonna have a concussion population as well there, but just your, um, have you seen anything about that? I have not, I have not seen that, but it sounds very important and, and definitely like something that needs to be explored further. I don't know, Catherine, have you? Uh, I'm sorry, I was uh, doing some admin thing. Could you repeat the question? Yes, in terms of has there been any studying of inmates nutritional status or malnutrition status? For instance, um, it's well known that they don't have enough food to eat and they have to pay for extra food and what's available to them uh, is bread and ramen noodles. Mm. And so essentially <laughs> they're malnourished and purchasing more food because they're so hungry and that's of no nutritional value either. So I'm just wondering if anybody had grabbed that bull by the horns to do some biochemical markers and see where they are. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And we actually are going to have an opportunity to ask that question and see what's being done. I'm just screen sharing for a second. I'm just gonna interrupt. Uh, this is the Pink X program which uh, we will be uh, presenting within IBIA, and that's uh, July 28th through 30th. And I just wanna point out that on this day, Wednesday, the 28th, behind locked doors connecting intimate partner violence and women in prison with brain injury. And we're going to have Stephen Casper talk about the history, Eve Valera talk about domestic violence. And then we have specialists from New Zealand, Cape Town, Scotland, and uh, the UK in general to talk about the prison populations and neurodiversity in those populations and brain injury in those populations. So that will would be definitely a question to ask then. And just to let you know that on Thursday, we're going to have sex differences, uh, John Letty, uh, Eve again, uh, uh, Tina Masters, Angela Colantano, just amazing people. And then we're gonna have a patient panel. Uh, and then on Friday, we're going to have understanding and dismantling systemic barriers faced by black women with lived experience of brain injury and black rehab professionals. And that will be um, another great group. Uh, Monique, uh, Samara, Dr. Gary, Sydney Hines will be there. So um, we will definitely be speaking more about the prison population. And, and and that connection. And then just wanna let you know on the overall Virtual World Congress, um, uh, Brian Enlow, Chris Giza, Jeff Manley, Professor Sky McDonald, um, Andreas Meyer Helm and Ian Robinson are the keynotes. Um, all of this, the Pink Concussions event, IBI event is one price for three days. Some days they're the four tracks of content. Um, so really just encouraging everybody again to sign up for that, also sign up for the race. And uh, yeah, and we are so excited we're able to bring you that thanks to the grant from Abbott. So uh, we'll jump back to uh, Dara. You have a question for Dr. McQuiston. Yes, thank you, Daria. Um, Dr. McQuiston, how available is this test? Is it in wide distribution? Anybody? Well, we were just to... we were just cleared so this year, so we're working to make that available. Terrific. So you don't you don't start manufacturing it until you don't count your chickens before they're hatched. You don't start manufacturing it until you're cleared. So um, we're working on that, and we're working to make that available as quickly as possible. And and we've gotten an overwhelming amount of interest. Yeah. What was that? 
I'm not trying to rush you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, well, there's been a tremendous amount of interest. So we know how important this is. We're going to make sure we get it right. And we're working to make it available as, as quickly as we can. Thank you for asking. Is there another question on the live call? If not, we'll wait a second and then we'll go back to Kara. Kara, do you have a question yes. for us? Yes, um, I see from um, Maria Alexander um, asks if you can discuss um, the phenomenon of flooding or intermittent altered consciousness or sensorium that can occur long after the concussion. And she gives an example, like if someone has a history of multiple concussions, mm -hmm. the last one was a couple of years ago, um, after the testing, there's you know notable fatigue, irritability, mm -hmm. um, you know challenges um, like that. Well, so, do you, what do you do for someone who goes through these confusion? Um, if seizure has been ruled out, and if nutrition at all plays a role in that. But you know, it's hard to give specific advice when I don't. We don't know the person, uh, and um, they're not my patient. But in general, what I can say is that there are a significant number of people that do sustain long-term problems. It can be up to 10 to 15% we can have problems longer than three months you know, with just even one concussion. There also seems to be some people are more susceptible to worse injury than others. And conversely, other people given the same injury may have more protection than others. So for, for everybody here, the important thing is, is awareness, you know, recognizing that you had an injury or you didn't, two, seeking out care, uh, three, working in an individualized approach with with a team. So making sure if you can get to a specialty, it sounds like for this situation, a specialty integrated center would be very important. You have sites that have integrated looking at your mental well-being as well as your physical well-being, nutrition, a really holistic integrated approach is very important. And then in terms of the area of green research, it's not necessarily specific for concussion, but for a wide variety of, of health conditions. We know that getting outside, we know that being in the forest, we know that if you can get down to the ocean or just going for a walk with some trees and some plants, it, there are absolutely mood modulating things that occur to your brain to lift your spirits. Also, there are compounds released by plants that can help modulate and improve your immune function. Really important, really important. Connecting with nature, getting outside in a safe way, right? not at 1 a.m. in the dark, no reflective tape, kind of the opposite of what we would recommend, but getting outside in a safe environment is and green exercise is extremely important. We also look at things like meditation, mindful meditation, integrating all of that together can be very, very healing, as well as things um, like physical exercise, individualized for you, music therapy. There are a lot of really adjacent therapies that can really help. And I think it's a really exciting time to be in the brain injury field. I mean, we really are the youngest arm of neurology. We were mm -hmm. considered sort of the ugly stepchild for many decades. And now, you know, I think it's kind of our time to come forward and do a lot of the testing, find these evidence-based approaches and find out who, who is best treated by which modality and which treatment. And I think that specialized care looking at gender, gender, sex, race, age, mm -hmm. um, all of those um, factors and more will, will yield more specialized and targeted healthcare in the future. Lisa, you had a, a question that would probably be our last. I did, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you had talked about, you know, uh, the plant based, and I'm wondering with the first 12 hours, um, in looking at the nutrition and you know the spike and, and the um, proteins, would stevia, the plant stevia, which is a sweetener, um, would that be more recommended to use a plant based sweetener than um, your sugars? I don't have any information on that. And I'm going to go to Catherine's recommendation. This is out of my lane. So I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know.
um, you know, I think for something along those lines, it seems like there's always a lot of active exploration and research studies and that one was thing and unique to evaluate. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just had one last quick question is since that sure. one was asked, sure. um, is just um, about, and I guess it has to do more with like the long-term treatments or looking ahead um, kind of thing is that because of like that there can be certain triggers for like your cognitive or your neuropsychological issues due to your hormones. And so, especially if it happens younger, so whether it's girls going through, you know, puberty at a younger age or then later pregnancy or menopause, just how, if there's any testing that you see that could go along with that to evaluate either what's, what's, you know, predict or just at the time of those changes, you know, to determine what the best course of treatment or nutrition, you know, would be. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a, an area of active exploration. So right now we're learning what is what happens, what is truth, what is optimal, what predisposes you to injury. And those are a lot of really important questions that a lot of really smart, committed folks are digging into, and we don't have the answers yet, but they are certainly under review. So I think well, taking that question and then coming back to that in a couple of years, we may have a lot more information on that. Okay, great. I think this next awesome. decade is going to be really exciting. And I just yeah. want to say, if you are a researcher and you're interested in this topic, I want to push more research researchers to look at, at sex-based um, hormones when they're doing this research, uh, reach out to Abbott, uh, reach out to find uh, different ways to include this or join other research projects, right? Bethy, you get your, mm -hmm. uh, you're involved in so much research right now with oh, yeah. institutions. Exactly. And, and one of the things that's really unique about this area is the extreme need to really have strong collaborative partnerships public-private partnerships. We can't go it alone. It's really important to have industry, academia, the military, um, groups such as the NIH, other regulatory agencies uh, out there from different countries all working together to solve this problem. It's, it's really truly a community approach. It's a very difficult, expensive area and we, it's really been heartwarming to see everyone coming together. If people I, I, are interested in reading some of your publications, um, oh, research, sure. is that accessible? I just see a question about that, um, which I think everyone would like to know. I think we have some listed uh, on our website or they'll be coming out. Um, a lot of the publications that have come out are not written by us. They've been in blinded. So people have sent us samples and they've we've tested those, sent them the results back. We didn't know what we were testing and they wrote the papers. So very compelling. It's not us sitting around saying what we think is true. You know, it's the highest rigorous form of research to have someone send you blinded samples from their research, send them the results and they independently analyze it. So I would say in terms of publications, some of the premier research is being done by Track TBI, and they have a lot of their publications listed on their website. That's T-R-A-C-K, Track TBI, and it's at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Uh, you can go to their website. They have a lot of groundbreaking research. They had a, a publication last year come out in Lancet uh, Neurology looking at these blood-based biomarkers when they were elevated, even when the head CT was negative, when they were elevated at a certain level, it predicted the brain MRI, which is more sensitive, was going to be positive. So it was a, they were able to capture that the brain was injured even when the CT was negative. How compelling is that? So a number of publications are on their website and a great group at multiple different sites across the United States. The highest rigor of scientific and scientific exploration and evaluation. And again, just to wrap this up, the invisible injury is only invisible because we don't have the technology to show the damage. It didn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be an invisible injury. We just don't have the tests yet. So those tests and whether it's blood biomarkers, whether it's imaging, those tests, once brain injury is no longer invisible, then we will be able to make better decisions, who gets what treatment, it'll help in litigation where people have been injured and wrongly by uh, others that 
that litigation helps very much to support the care of people with brain injury in the United States. That's a big part of how people pay for their injuries. All of these different pieces from treatment to litigation, do we actually need um, these visible signs of brain injury? So I want to thank you, Beth. Dr. McQuiston for being on the show. Thank you for being my friend for the last six, seven years. And thank you for your support for Pink Concussions. It, it really allows us to go and reach more people. So thank you very much. Any final thoughts? Just appreciate all that you're doing. And to everyone on the call here, I know a lot of people are supporting traumatic brain injury research. Thank you for that and keep going. We're making huge strides and advancements and there's a lot of hope for the future definitely a lot of hope. So thank you, everyone. Please sign up for the IBIA uh, uh, Race for Research. Uh, it's very low entry cost and will provide funding for a number of organizations, one of which is Pink Concussions. And then also please do sign up. There's an early bird rate for the conference. And again, you get three days of the conference, all of the international brain injury uh, program and three days of pink for one price. So thank you, everybody. Have a great week. And uh, next week, we'll have uh, my dear friend, Rachel Ramirez talking about domestic violence and TBI and her workout in Ohio. So thank you, Dr. McQuiston. Have a great day. Thank you, Kara, for your questions. And thank you for the IBI team. I do a Tuesday call without them. It is really nice to have a tech team with us. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.